good morning again. Good morning to those of you online and uh, listening in today. We're glad that you are with us. We're in Isaiah 53, if you want to get there uh, in your Bibles and turn over that direction. Hey, let me start this morning by just saying I really appreciate the doctors and nurses and technicians and everybody that work in our medical field and medical industry. Can we just give them a round of applause this morning? Thank them for being there to help us when we are hurting and when we need help. Uh, They do a great job for us. I'm saying that because uh, now I'm going to bash them a little bit. I really do appreciate them. We, We had two doctors with us in our earlier service, and they left with a smile on their face, so I think it's okay uh, what I'm about to say. I'm a little skeptical of them, doctors and uh, nurses and these people in the medical world. Forgive me for being just a little bit skeptical um, of them, but, you know, they do say they are practicing medicine. Have you all ever noticed that? Some of them need to practice a little more, a little harder. Um, Man, I had so much fun doing some research for this sermon. We're talking about radical remedies today. And uh, the reason I'm a little bit skeptical of the medical field is is because of what I'm about to tell you. They they haven't always gotten it right. (laughs) In fact, they've gotten it really, really wrong. And not just for 15 years or a decade or two, but I'm talking about for hundreds and hundreds of years, um, the remedies that have been offered by the medical field have not always been the best. Like, y'all have probably heard of, of the ones we see most of the time in the movies, like bloodletting. Hey, you're sick? Oh, let's cut you open and bleed you out. That sounds like it'll make you better. They did that for a really, really long time. Uh, if you had bad headaches back in the day, what maybe what we would call a migraine today, you know what, what the remedy for that was? Drill a hole in your skull and let the evil spirits out. And uh, they, it, it took them hundreds, a thousand years to figure out that didn't work, uh, really, that that wasn't the best solution uh, for, for a headache or a migraine. Um, you've probably heard of leeches. They were widely used for various ailments. But those are the ones you've heard of. But here's some maybe you haven't heard of as much. They just haven't been popularized in our movies. But, but they were very popular medical things for a long time, some remedies that would be offered. Uh, for example, if you take an egg and boil it, you got to boil an egg, get you a boiled egg, and then you peel the boiled egg and you take a silver coin. has to be a silver coin for this to work. If you take that boiled egg and you push a silver coin into it and lay it on a bruise or a wound that you have, supposedly 30 minutes with that boiled egg on your bruise or wound will cut the healing time in half. For, for your bruise. Have you, any of y'all ever heard that one? That, that was a, a prescribed medical treatment for a really, really long time. Here's another one for you. This one's kind of gross. Um, so, so just get ready. Uh, they used to believe that you could take some of your earwax, had to be your earwax, couldn't be the earwax of somebody else. But if you dug some earwax out of your ear and you had a, a cold sore on your lip, if you put your earwax on your lip, supposedly that would, that would heal your cold sore. Turns out it doesn't work. By the way, um, none of what I'm telling y'all sh- you should do, okay? This is all false. I'm not encouraging you or telling you that these things work uh, because they have been proven not to work. I have to say that, you know, they have to put a warning label on everything because inevitably somebody will go home and try some of this stuff and say, well, Pastor Pete said. No, no, this stuff doesn't work. Here's another one for you. This one was was most popular in England, but uh, it was popular in other places over in Europe as well. How many of you have ever had a sore throat? Anybody ever had a sore throat? Hundreds of years, hundreds of years, the prescribed remedy for a sore throat was to take the dirtiest, nastiest pair of socks you had at your house and wrap them around your throat. And that was supposed to cure you. Now, if you had a really bad case of sore throat, or if you wanted it to just get better even quicker, supposedly you can make a hot tea with your dirty socks and drink it, and it would heal, heal your throat. Many tribes down in the Amazon uh, believe that licking frogs 
heals you of various things. Um, that's, that's been something people, people have tried. Uh, here's another one for you. This is 18th, 19th century stuff, guys. I mean, we're not talking Stone Age stuff. Uh, 18th and 19th century, do you know what the most common cure for asthma was? You're having a hard time breathing? It would only make sense um, to go smoke some tobacco, right? That was the most common cure for asthma in the 18th and 19th century. It only took doctors about 250 years to figure out that that, that wasn't really helping people and didn't actually, actually work. How many of you know what mercury is? Mercury. Have you ever thought, you know, if I want to get better, I think I'll rub a little mercury on it? <laughs> Probably not. But for a really, really long time, mercury was a widely used and prescribed product to get people better. It was used as a rub. Uh, it was inhaled. It was ingested for all kinds of, of various problems. With the invention of electricity came some doctors who said, you know what, we can fix it by shocking it out of you. And uh, they used electric shock for a whole ton of things. And did you know, as late as the 18th century, I realize none of y'all were around then, but as late as the 18th century, again, we're not talking Stone Age stuff, we're talking 18th century here, do you know that the main treatment or prescribed thing to do when somebody drowned in a body of water, like a river or a lake, they went and they drowned. Do you know what they said you could do to bring them back? A smoke enema. A smoke enema. Johnny drowns in the, the water. Light a fire, honey. You're going to blow some smoke in there and it's going to wake him up. Well, I guess if anything was going to wake him up, that would be it. But couldn't find any instance anywhere... I couldn't find any instance anywhere where it worked, but I found a whole bunch of people who tried it because that's what you were supposed to do uh, when somebody drowned. Those are just a handful of the ram radical remedies that people have tried over the years. Um, I can tell you I wouldn't recommend them. I can tell you I don't think that they are going to work. And I can also tell you that today we're going to read about a radical remedy for sin that God prescribes. And I can tell you that his radical remedy for your sin and for mine is equally radical. In fact, it's a complex remedy to try to comprehend with your mind. It's a difficult remedy to describe with words. It's a perplexing and even preposterous and very puzzling remedy in every way imaginable, yet it is the one and only radical remedy that God prescribes for sinners to be saved. If you will dare to dwell with me here in our text for a few minutes, and if the Lord chooses to give you ears to hear and eyes to see, I believe you are going to see some very good news today. Good news for you and good news for all the world. Good news for any who can hear my voice this is not Isaiah's news. It's not my news. It is the good news of God, the good news of the gospel. And it is God's radical remedy for your sins and for mine. And isn't it great and isn't it awe-inspiring that the Spirit of God instructed the prophet Isaiah to write these words 700 years before Jesus was ever even born. So if they sound radical and ridiculous to you, imagine how it must have sounded to him when he was penning it. Here's what it says, Isaiah 53, 10 and 11. This is our text for today, these two powerful verses. It says, Yet the Lord was pleased to crush him severely. When you make him a guilt offering, he will see his seed he will prolong his days, and by his hand the Lord's pleasure will be accomplished. After his anguish he will see light and be satisfied. By his knowledge my righteous servant will justify many, and he will carry their iniquities. 
My friends, one of the great truths we see from this text is our big idea for today. The thing I do not want you to forget. The thing I want you to walk out of here and remember and be stuck in your head. The thing I'm going to say over and over and over again today, which is this. Sin requires a radical remedy. It requires a radical remedy. And the cross of Christ was not an afterthought. It was not something that was not known to the mind or to the heart of God. Indeed, in one of his sermons, the Apostle Peter proclaimed in Acts chapter 2, verse 22 and 24, he said, Fellow Israelites, listen to these words. This Jesus of Nazareth was a man attested to you by God with miracles, wonders, and signs that God did among you through him, just as you yourselves know. And then listen to this next verse, verse 23. He says, Though he was delivered up according to God's determined plan and foreknowledge, you used lawless people to nail him to a cross and to kill him. God raised him up, ending the pains of death, because it was not possible for him to be held by death. This was not a surprise. Did not catch God off guard. Peter says, though he was delivered up according to God's determined plan and foreknowledge. What what is Peter getting at here? Peter, Peter is saying, Jesus is not the victim of the cross. So many times we want to make Jesus the victim of the cross. Peter is saying, Jesus is not the victim of the cross. He is the victor on the cross. There's a difference between those two realities about Jesus and who you make him. Is he a victim or is he the victor? Peter says he's the victor. This this didn't catch God off guard. It didn't catch God by surprise. The cross was God's pathway to victory over sin for all of us. Before being crucified, Jesus himself had this exchange with Pilate. I love it. John 19, starting in verse 10. So Pilate said to him, do you refuse to speak to me? Don't you know that I have the authority to release you and the authority to crucify you? And Jesus says this in verse 11, you would have no authority over me at all if it hadn't been given to you from above. Jesus says, don't you fool yourself there, big boy. You got no authority over me. You are just a pawn in God's eternal plan. And victory is coming, and you're going to be a part of it. John 10, Jesus told his disciples this, verses 17 and 18, this is why the Father loves me. Because I lay down my life so that I may take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down on my own. I have the right to lay it down, and I have the right to take it up again. I have received this command from my Father. He is not the victim of the cross. He is the victor on the cross. Jesus said, the Holy Spirit knew And God knew. They all were in on this. They all knew that sin required a radical remedy. And the radical remedy is Jesus. His name is Jesus. If you're lost, if you don't know the Lord, if you are a sinner and you have not been saved, I have good news for you this day. You can be saved today. You can walk out of here transformed and change because the remedy that you're looking for and the only remedy that will work for your life or anybody else's when it comes to sin is Jesus. The remedy you're searching for is him. I want to share with you today four radical things we see here from the pen of the prophet Isaiah predicted some 700 years against all odds, 700 years before Jesus was ever even born. The first radical thing we see is radical resolve. The radical resolve of God. Resolve is the firm determination to do something, to get something done. It's the spirit that says, against all odds, I'm going to do this, whatever this might be. 
Have you ever had to have some resolve in life? How many of you have ever had to have some kind of, of resolve? Anybody? Okay, good. Those of you who didn't raise your hand, you're either sleeping or lazy. I don't know. I would suspect we've all had to have some resolve at some point in life. Maybe it was back when you were younger and you were athletic. Looking at y'all, you ain't athletic no more. But I know when you were younger, you probably were. And maybe you can remember that time when your team was down and the clock was running out. And you came together as a team and you said, you know what, we're going to win this game. We're going to all work together. We're going to fight through the pain. We're going to push past it. We're going to do whatever we have to do to win this game. And your resolve was all in. You were there and you were ready to win that game. Maybe it was some point in your career, your working years, that you had to have the resolve to save your business, to save your ranch, to save your farm. And you just had to bear down and you had to make some hard decisions and some difficult choices in order to make sure it survived. Maybe it was your marriage. Maybe you're in the middle of that right now and you've just had to say, you know what, listen, we're going to come together and we're going to do this. We're going to make this work. We're going to work this out. We're going to compromise. We're going to push past our pride. We're going to forgive each other for past mistakes, whatever the case may be. But whatever happens, we're staying in this together. Because we said, till death do us part, and we're going to have the resolve to make that work. Maybe you said, hey, I'm going to read the Bible every day this year. And then the devil started throwing temptation in front of you and other things started coming up and getting in the way, and you had to have the resolve to say, I'm going to do that. Maybe you decided you wanted to buy a house, and, and you had to save a down payment, and you had to get your credit in order, and you said, you know what, I'm going to focus on this and have the resolve to get this done. Maybe, maybe you're like Abby and I, and you woke up one day a couple years after being married and said, whoa, we're in a lot of debt, <laughs> And we don't like that. We're going to pay that off. We're going to get out of debt. And then you have the resolve to, over the course of months, or in our case, years, pay that down and work at it and do what had to be done and be disciplined enough to make it happen. Maybe, it doesn't look like it, but maybe some of y'all have had the resolve to lose some weight. <laughs> few, of, few of you have. Maybe it was to get the promotion. There's a, there's a lot of things. My, my point is this. There's a lot of things in life that take resolve. There's a lot of things in life you cannot do without having resolve. And I'm certain that at some point in your life, you've had to make up your mind that no matter what, you were going to accomplish this thing, this goal. You were going to do this thing that you felt like was a purpose for your life. And if you have had to have some resolve, then you know something of the focus, the pain, the sacrifice, and the overall hardship that comes with setting and reaching great goals or a great purpose. You know something of what it takes to day after day, sometimes moment by moment, have the resolve to press on. Now, can you imagine the radical resolve necessary to sacrifice your own child for the sake of others? Sin requires a radical remedy. Hebrews 9 tells us that blood is required. Hebrews 9.22, according to the law, almost everything is purified with blood. And without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. A sinless lamb was needed. A pure, undefiled sacrifice was required. Pure, sinless, undefiled blood was required to pay the debt for your sins and mine. A radical remedy was necessary. And this is why Isaiah says this in verse 10, 
yet the Lord was pleased to crush him severely. Oh, the resolve of God. The love of God, the determination of God to save your soul. It was so strong and so resolute that the Lord was pleased to crush him severely. My friends, Judas may have betrayed him. False witnesses may have been the ones to accuse him. Herod might have been the one who ultimately convicted him. The chief priests and the Jews are the ones who condemned him to death. The crowd, yeah, they're the ones who said, crucify him, crucify him, crucify him. I know it was the soldiers who mocked him and beat him and drove the nails into his flesh. I get it, but it was God who crushed him with the weight of sin. Your sins and mine. Romans 5, 8 through 10, but God proves his own love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. He crushed him. How much more then, since we have now been justified by his blood, it's the only way to be justified, how much more then will we be saved through him from wrath? For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son, then how much more, having been reconciled, will we be saved by his life? This radical resolve reminds us that sin requires a radical remedy, and his name is Jesus. There's also a radical result, seven of them actually, radical results that we see here in this text As I mentioned at the beginning, Jesus was not a victim of the cross. He was victorious on the cross. There's a difference between the two. And here in verses 10 and 11, we see no fewer than seven radical results from the crushing of our sinless lamb. All seven come about. All seven undeniably happened. But for the sake of time today, we will not have time to discuss all seven I'm going to talk about two in the midst of this point. We'll cover two in our next point as well along the way. And the others, I believe, are so obvious and so common sense, they're very easy to understand and see. See if you can see the seven results here in Isaiah 53, 10 and 11, as I read it to you one more time. Yet the Lord was pleased to crush him severely. When you make him a guilt offering, he will see his seed. He will prolong his days. And by his hand, the Lord's pleasure will be accomplished. After his anguish, he will see light and be satisfied. By his knowledge, my righteous servant will justify many, and he will carry their iniquities. Isaiah was given the eyes to see and the ears to hear seven of the wonderful results of the cross of Christ more than 700 years before Jesus was born against all odds. And against all odds, all seven of these things happen. They come about. They're proven true. He will see his seed. He will prolong his days. The Lord's pleasure will be accomplished. He will see light. He will be satisfied. He will justify many. And he will carry their iniquities. Any one of these things would be a radical result. Amen? Any one of these things would be a big deal. But there is no way all seven of these things happen. It's impossible for all seven of these things to happen through the life of one person without God. We simply don't have time today to look at each of these, but let's consider the second and the third one here for a moment. He will prolong his days and the Lord's pleasure will be accomplished. So unlike the readers of Isaiah's day, we know how the story ends. We know that after the death of Christ, after being sealed in a tomb, after being resurrected from the grave, after three days, we know that Jesus later ascends into heaven. We know the result. We know he's alive. We know that God prolonged his days. We know that's been accomplished. Amen? We know that he is alive. And more specifically, we know that he is eternal. We know What Jesus was getting at in places like John chapter 8, verse 58, 
where Jesus said to them, Truly I tell you, before Abraham was, I am. He was saying, I've always been, and I will always be. We have a better context for that than certainly Isaiah did, or even the disciples did when Jesus said it. We know that the Apostle Paul was right in Colossians 1.17, when he said, He is before all things, and by him all things hold together. He's eternal. We believe the testimony of the beloved Apostle John, who actually saw Jesus in heaven, and who was physically touched by Jesus post-resurrection. Revelation 1, 17, 18, he reports, When I saw him, I fell at his feet like a dead man, and he laid his right hand on me and said, Don't be afraid. I am the first and the last and the living one. I was dead, but look, I am alive forever and ever, and I hold the keys of death and hell. Thus, we know and we believe that God indeed prolonged the days of his son, because he conquered the grave and was victorious on the cross, not a victim of it. Furthermore, we know that he's coming back for us. We know that he's gone to prepare a place in heaven for us. We know that he's the Alpha and the Omega. We know that he's the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And we also know that God was pleased with him. We know that he prolonged his days, but we also know that God was pleased with him. We have a testimony of it in Scripture. At the beginning of Jesus' ministry, he goes to be baptized by John. And the Gospels record it this way. Here's Mark's account and version. We'll just read his for the sake of time. Mark chapter 1, verse 10. As soon as he came up out of the water, this is Jesus, he saw the heavens being torn open and the Spirit descending on him like a dove. And a voice came from heaven. And what did this voice say? You are my beloved son, with you I am well pleased. At the transfiguration of Christ, the disciples hear God say something very similar all over again. Matthew 17, verses 5 and 6. While he was still speaking, suddenly a bright cloud covered them, and a voice from the cloud said, This is my beloved son, with whom I am. Am well pleased. And then God says, Listen to him. (laughs) Pay attention to what he's saying. This is Jesus, it's the Messiah. You better listen up and pay attention. I, I love that. Listen to him. When the disciples heard this, they fell face down and they were terrified. So we can see from the testimony of Scripture that God was pleased with Jesus at the start of his ministry. We see that God is still pleased with him deep, deep, deep into his ministry. And then Paul shows us that God was pleased with him after his ministry was over. And and God had taken Jesus back to heaven. Paul said this in Colossians 1, 19 and 20. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him. And through him to reconcile everything to himself, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. We could look at many, many more passages of Scripture, but the reality that Christ made it His aim to please His Father is no secret. And the reality that God was pleased by His Son is no secret. Jesus, all Jesus wanted to do in His ministry was please God. It's all that mattered to Him. In fact, Jesus said it in John chapter 8, verse 29, He says, the one who sent me is with me. He has not left me alone because I always do what pleases him. Wouldn't you all like to have your kids do that? Wouldn't you love to have your employees do that? Jesus said, I'm going to please God no matter what. I wonder, wouldn't God want us to do that too? As Christians, as followers of Christ, as his hands and feet, shouldn't that be our goal and aim every day to please God? To do what pleases Him. To live in a way that pleases Him. To make every minute and every moment of every minute matter. Not for us, but for Him. To please Him. And these are just two of the radical results that Isaiah predicted against all odds 700 years before Christ was born. 
And they were, indeed, all accomplished. And I'll tell you again, it's all because sin required a radical remedy, and that remedy is Jesus. Number three, we see a radical responsibility in this text, a radical responsibility. And I can promise you, no matter how hard I try, I cannot even begin to fathom the weight of this radical responsibility Christ carried on his shoulders. At the end of verse 11, it says this, and he will carry their iniquities. That's a radical responsibility. Isaiah has previously mentioned this in verse 5 of this chapter by saying it like this, but he was pierced because of our rebellion, crushed because of our iniquities. Punishment for our peace was on him, and we are healed by his wounds. And the radical result of this amazing act of love and grace was that you and I could be made clean and made righteous before God. Punishment for our peace was on him. We are healed by his wounds because sin requires a radical remedy. And Jesus took on that radical responsibility. In the New Testament, 1 John says it like this. 1 John chapter 2 Verses 1 and 2, my little children, I'm writing you these things so that you may not sin. But if anyone does sin, that part there for for me. But if anyone does sin, what does he say? He says, we have an advocate with the Father, amen? We have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous one, the pure one, the sinless one, the Son of God himself. He goes on to say, he himself is the atoning sacrifice for our sins. Sin requires a radical remedy. His name is Jesus. He himself is the atoning sacrifice for our sins. And not only for ours, but also for those of the whole world. The cross was God's radical plan and provision for the entire world. Peter declares in 1 Peter 2, 24 and 25, He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree so that having died to sins, we might live for righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed for you were like sheep going astray, but you have now returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. I wish we had the time to look at this even more, but I really just want you to understand this one major truth today. Sin requires a radical remedy. God's radical resolve and his radical results and Jesus taking this radical responsibility all lead us to this radical remedy, which is our final point for today. The radical remedy for sin. The radical remedy of God. If you're looking for a remedy for your sin, I'll tell you today there is only one. You don't have options, you just have one. There are not multiple ways to be saved. There are not multiple ways to be forgiven. There are not multiple ways to get into heaven. There's just one. One radical remedy. One that will work. One that is true. And his name is Jesus. Acts chapter 4 verse 12. There is salvation in no one else. For there is no other name under heaven given to people by which we must be saved. Jesus is his name. 1 Timothy 2, 5 and 6. For there is one God and one mediator between God and mankind. The man, Christ Jesus. Jesus is his name. He gave himself as a ransom for all, a testimony at the proper time. Jesus himself testifies to it in places like John 14. Verse 6, Jesus told him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And catch this last part. Jesus says, no one comes to the Father except through me. Sin requires a radical remedy, and his name is Jesus. He's the way, he's the truth, he's the life, and he is the absolute single and only way you will ever get to the Father and to heaven. You know, there are some out there who don't believe Isaiah chapter 53 is even about Jesus at all. Some think that the prophet was talking about the nation of Israel in this chapter. 
Others believe that Isaiah was talking about himself. That Isaiah is building himself up here in this chapter as this suffering servant for God. To be honest with you, I don't know how they can get to these conclusions. I've read all of their conclusions and to me it's just preposterous. There's no way Isaiah can meet all of this stuff. There's certainly no way the nation of Israel meets the qualifications of who the servant in chapter 53 of Isaiah is. But honestly, I cannot wrap my head around anybody with with any kind of theological sense or spiritual understanding of the Word of God could ever come to this conclusion if for no other reason because of what it says in Acts chapter 8. Jump with me, if you will, to Acts chapter 8. I want to read to you a somewhat long portion of Scripture here, verses 29 through 35, because it lays it all to rest. This is indeed about Jesus. Your sin and mine requires a radical remedy, and Jesus is his name, and Isaiah saw it and heard it and penned it 700 years against all odds before he was ever even born. In Acts chapter 8, we find a familiar passage of Scripture, a familiar story. It begins like this in verse 29, the Spirit told Philip, go and join that chariot. And when Philip ran up to it, Can I pause there for a moment for a brief side note? God, the Spirit, tells Philip to go and join the chariot. And did you notice what it said Philip did? He ran up to it. He didn't think about it. He didn't pray about it. He didn't ask what the result was going to be whenever he got up there. He didn't didn't beg God to tell him everything he was supposed to say. It just says God told him to do it. The Spirit told him to do it. And he went and did it. Church, when God tells you to do something, you go do it. You run up to it. You embrace it. You don't have to ponder it. You don't have to think about it. You don't have to wonder if you're supposed to do it. If God told you to do it, you go do it. So he goes and does it. And then he hears this man in the chariot who he doesn't know. He hears him reading, guess where? The prophet Isaiah. And he said, do do you understand what you're reading, Mr. Man in your chariot here? And the man says, how can I? Unless someone guides me. So he invited Philip to come up and sit with him. And now the scripture passage he was reading was this. And you tell me if it sounds familiar. It should. It's from Isaiah 53. He was led like a sheep to the slaughter and a lamb is silent before his shearer. So he does not open his mouth. In his humiliation, justice was denied him. Who will describe his generation for his life is taken from the earth? The eunuch then said to Philip, I ask you, who is the prophet saying this about? Himself or someone else? Is this about Isaiah? He was a little confused about it too. Is this about the nation of Israel? Is this, is this about Isaiah or is this about someone else? And I want you to see, verse 35, Philip proceeded to tell him the good news about Jesus, beginning with that scripture. He didn't tell him the good news about Isaiah. He didn't tell him the good news about Israel. He told him the good news about Jesus beginning with that scripture because that's what this scripture is about. Philip told him the good news about Jesus because this man, just like every man I can see and every man or woman who can hear my voice right now, this man right here needed a radical remedy for his sin and Philip knew Jesus was the only one who was up to the task. Jesus is the only Radical remedy for his sins and for yours. You see, sin requires a radical remedy, and his name is Jesus. And if you haven't taken it already, if you haven't believed and confessed, if you haven't repented of your sins and given your life to Jesus, I told you at the beginning of this hour you would have a chance to do so before we close. You don't have to leave the same way you came. And I got good news for you. This remedy right here, it doesn't involve drinking tea made out of your nasty socks you're wearing on your feet. You don't have to lick a frog. We're not going to let any blood out of you. 
Your blood wouldn't do a lick of good against your sin. We're not, we're not trying to sell you something from a snake oil wagon that came through town and says, rub this on your head and it'll make your hair grow again. No. This is the blood of Jesus. This is the radical remedy that God prescribed 700 years before Jesus was ever even born. And then he came and fulfilled everything right here in this entire chapter and in all of the Old Testament, for that matter. Lived a sinless, perfect life for you. Went and died on a cross for you. Shed his blood for you so you could be forgiven. It's a spoonful of sugar. Take it. You are not going to regret it. It doesn't even taste bad. If you don't know Jesus and you need to be saved and need this remedy, take it today. Let's pray. If that's you, we're not going to ask you to raise a hand, stand up, come to the front. I'm not going to ask you to pray out loud. If you're here and you need to repent, that's between you and the Lord. You do your business with him here. We're going to lead you in a prayer and give you an opportunity to believe and to confess that Jesus is the one and the only remedy for the sin you carry. And the Bible says if you repent, if you believe and you confess, the Bible says this very day you will be saved. Your name written in the Lamb's book of life. Heaven and glory and eternity will be yours. Not because of who you are, but because of the remedy that he provides. So if that's you, pray with me and say this. Say, Lord, it's me. I confess that I'm a sinner. I know that I've messed things up and gone astray. So I ask now by faith that you would save me. Lord, I ask by faith that you would forgive me. I ask by faith that you would change me and make me new. Lord, I thank you for your grace and your goodness, for your forgiveness. And for giving me this remedy for the one problem myself or no one else in my life could solve. Thank you for dying for me. Lord, as we close today, I thank you for these who've gathered here to worship you. I thank you for those who already know the reality of the remedy we have spoken of today. And I thank you equally for those who have just come to the cross this hour and claim the victory that you bought for them there victory over death, the victory over sin, the victory over pride and selfishness, conceit. Lord, the victory over any trial or temptation that can face them or come their way. Lord, we thank you for those who claimed it today for the very first time and we pray, Lord, that you would move and walk with them as they walk with you. We love you and we thank you for sending us this great remedy for our great problem. We thank you for Jesus. And it's in his precious and holy name we pray.